week on One Devotion. A Euroleague veteran recounts his unusual road to stardom. A legend pinpoints the magic night that was a turning point in his career. A rookie gives thanks for the opportunity to prove that he is healed. And a truly amazing buzzer beater tops the week's biggest moments. In an age when many young prospects leave their families and change countries in order to advance their sporting development, for Linas Kleiser of EA7 Emporio Armani Milan, it was the other way around. When Kleiser was 10, his parents headed to the United States to pursue their careers as artists, leaving young Linas back home in Lithuania. It was, it was their choice, professional choice, so everything worked out for them and I stayed back. Uh, I had a good thing going with basketball at that time, so uh, I didn't, we didn't see a reason to move. And uh, so I stayed back with my grandparents and my aunt and uncle and, uh, you know, keep my, uh, getting my education and playing basketball at a very high level. Even at a young age, Klaser had the conviction that his country's national sport was going to be his future. In Lithuania, basketball is, 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 is very big, so I kind of knew I wanted to do that from uh, day one, and uh, uh, it kind of worked out. I didn't think about anything else at that time, and I knew that was, that's what I was going to do. Thanks to the care from his extended family in Lithuania, Kleiser does not recall that being separated from his parents was particularly difficult, but rather a key part of his personal development, even though it wasn't always easy. We always stay close being far away, and uh, I was so busy with basketball, and uh, that time flew by. And, you know, but I, I think it was the right decision. Uh, uh, make me more mature and uh, kind of grow up at an early age. By age 16, Klaser was reunited with his parents when his blossoming basketball career took him to high school in the United States. Perhaps due to the independence he had gained at an early age, he remembers the transition as relatively smooth. It was good, it was a whole new experience, not, not about my parents, but just going to new school, uh, learning English and uh, trying to integrate myself. So, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of international uh, students and players on our team, so they kind of made it easy. After heading to America, Klaser was able to spend more time with his parents, but soon realized that he had inherited none of their artistic abilities. Uh, my brother or me, uh, not at all. We cannot draw, we cannot sing, we cannot do anything. The closest that Klaser got to his parents' artwork was hauling around their supplies during summers he spent with them. My dad gave me the opportunity to make little money, <laughs> you know, just being around, so it was good, but nothing artistic. Being closer to his parents, keen fans who first met at a basketball game while they were in art school together allowed them to begin following Klaser's career year-round. They get to see me, they watch every game I play uh, uh, all the time, so, you know, uh, they definitely enjoy it. And, I think it's a, it's a roller coaster for them too. It's a good game and everything is good, but you know how it goes. Glazer is sure now that being separated from his parents and then reunited with them did nothing but help him grow as a person. Everything worked out fine. I was happy, you know, it was, uh, uh, I didn't feel left behind, so everything was good and, you know, we, we made it through as a family and it's, I don't have no hard feelings or nothing uh, from that past that really is bothering me, you know. I think it worked out great. I went through a lot of things and I was able to experience a lot of, a lot of things on my own and I think that made me who I am today. If Nizhny Novgorod is among the most pleasant surprises in the Turkish Airlines Euroleague this season, so is one of its main players, power forward Trey Tompkins. 
In the summer of 2012, Tomkins suffered an injury that required almost two years of rehabilitation before he could come back to the court. But when he finally did this season, Tomkins made a name for himself quickly in his new competition. I had a microfractured knee surgery. Uh, it happened in 2012 of Summer League. Uh, first play just landed wrong on a rebound. And um, my recovery, it took about nine and a half to ten months. It was very grueling mentally and physically, but it started with baby steps and then took it slowly at first and then gradually got back to running and got back to into playing shape. Last summer, when Tompkins got a call from Nizhny Novgorod offering him a chance to complete his comeback by playing in the EuroLeague, he didn't think twice. Uh, it was great, man. It was a blessing. Um, my uh, people came to me and told me that I had an opportunity to play EuroLeague, uh, the best league in Europe, and um, I, I was ecstatic about it. I was so happy. Tompkins not only appreciated the opportunity, but has ridden it like a rocket since opening day. After more than 20 games, he now ranks as the EuroLeague's second-best rebounder and eighth-best scorer this season. But as much as he liked finding his game again, Tompkins loves taking his talents to new places. I'm very happy. Um, I got an opportunity to see so many different countries, so many different places, play in different countries, and um, play in front of great crowds and um, show what I can do. Living outside his country has also allowed Tompkins to learn about himself off the court too. I learned a lot. I learned I can be very independent. I can um, mentally stay strong. And um, over this whole injury and coming back and playing this season and uh, being able to play so well, thanks to my teammates and my coaches, um, it, it showed me a lot about myself. Travelling around the continent and adjusting to a new country is never easy, but Tompkins gives a lot of credit to everyone around him at Nizhny Novgorod. It was tough at first, but um, I'm th very thankful that uh, my teammates are great guys and my coaches are great guys, and they helped me uh, step by step until I can handle it on my own. And uh, now I'm, I'm pretty much settled in, and it's, it's a great experience. Considering all the potential problems that come with any comeback from injury, Tompkins can look back now and know that he made the right choice by playing with Nishni in the EuroLeague. It makes me feel blessed, man. It makes me feel great. Uh, I, like I said, I got a great opportunity to come to Russia and play with Nizhny in EuroLeague and uh, make an impact as soon as possible. And, and I did so. My teammates and my coaches uh, get all the credit for that. Although it took Tompkins almost two years to return to doing what he loves best, he only needed to get a taste of the EuroLeague to know that this was both the perfect challenge for him and the perfect reward for his devotion to get him back in the game. I heard about EuroLeague, they told me this was the best league in, uh, in Europe and I, I agree with them 100%. Every night you got to come with your best and it, it's been a great experience to be able to come back and play. Let's find out what happened in round 12 of the top 16. Real Madrid got back into winning ways, Barcelona stayed strong and playoff chasing Panathinaikos and Alba Berlin both triumphed. In a rematch of last season's final, Real Madrid took a big early lead over Maccabi Electra Tel Aviv and stayed in front all the way, earning home court advantage in the playoffs. Madrid's victory also handed home court advantage to FC Barcelona, which claimed its sixth straight victory by leaning on big bench performances from Thibaut Place and Alex Abrines to prevail over Jalgiris Kaunas, despite 24 points from James Anderson. Galatasaray and Panathinaikos contested a close encounter, which went down to the final seconds and a series of free throws before the Greens eventually held on for a key win in the playoff race. Alba Berlin kept its playoff hopes very much alive with a crucial victory over Servena Zvezda, using 18 points from Marko Banic and 11 assists from Reggie Redding to overcome another huge performance from the unstoppable Boban Marjanovic, who registered a career-high 27 points in defeat. Real Madrid remains one point in front of FC Barcelona ahead of next week's meeting between the teams, while Maccabi, Panathinaikos and Alba are chasing the remaining two playoff spots.
Top 3 Seska Moscow, Fenerbahce Ulker and Olympiakos all won and EA7 Milan boosted its playoff hopes with a key home victory. Fenerbahce Ulker maintained its red-hot form by easing to victory over Unicaja Malaga, with 22 points from Andrew Gaudelot leading the way for Jelko Obradovic's men to record their ninth straight win, but a season-ending injury to Ricky Hickman dampened the celebrations. Group co-leader Seska Moscow trailed by 13 at half-time against Nizhny Novgorod, but used a huge third quarter, sparked by Sunny Weems, to fight back, before holding off a late rally from the hosts. Olympiakos Pirelos got back into winning ways and secured a playoff place by edging a thriller against Anadolu Efes and former coach Dusan Ivkovic. Strong performances from Oliver Lafayette with 17 points and Georgios Printesis with a double-double allowed the Reds to overcome the absence of injured leader Vasilis Panoulis. EA7 Milan recovered from an early double-digit deficit against Laboral Kucha to keep the race for the fourth playoff spot very tight as red-hot Alessandro Gentile scored 29 points in a high-scoring victory. Fenerbahce and Seska retain control of the top two places with Olympiakos just behind. Four teams are still fighting for fourth. of the game, you know. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a guard, and he knows basketball. I don't see anybody as a coach right now. I think uh, Alexei Zazulin. He have experience, I think, and his father coach too, and probably he know how to work on this situation. Um, I would love to be coach someday after uh, career. Maybe, maybe me or Hostov, just because lots of times point guards become coaches. This young guy, Mark Woodridge, he every time talk about basketball, he know everything, he know places, like uh, action where to play. Devin Smith, I can see him being a coach. Uh, Marcelino Huertas, I think, has a good chance of being a coach because he's a great point guard and, and understands the game. Mm. Sonny Mitaya, Fernando, because he's really smart in the way he thinks about basketball. Uh, he got like, uh, when he talks, you know, you, you listen because like he has really a lot of experience and he, when he talks, it's always like a smart. He doesn't talk a lot, but it's really interesting when, when, when he's talking. Um, Navarro obviously could be a good coach, but I don't know if he wants to be since he's not the, the most, the loudest guy. I think Stefan. I, I, that's my vision, you know, how I, I can see it. I think Ante Tomic could be a good coach. I think he understands the game really well. I'm not sure if that's something he wants to be, but uh, he's one of the guys that, that knows what's going on on the court. I think Mazaris. Because, okay, he, he can understand some things. Joe could be a boxer. Uh, Buba or Host in soccer. I can play ping pong pretty well. They call me Jason Lee. For real. During his two seasons in the Turkish Airlines Euroleague, Ryan Toulson has developed a reputation for possessing one of the best shooting techniques in the competition. And the Unicaja Malaga star believes his ability to score is a combination of natural talent and hard work. I think growing up is always something I had but it was also something that I loved to do, and so I, I continued to work on it more and more as I, as I grew older. I think if you have talent, it's obviously easy, but when you have that talent and you work just as hard as other people, you'll be able to be as great as whoever you want to be. Tulson is certainly no stranger to hard work. He spends hour after hour by himself during the off-season working to perfect his shooting technique. In the summers, uh, when I work out all by myself, I start just all by myself in the gym where I shoot one-handed shots just from point blank, very close to the basket. 
and after I go around the basket and make a few, then I'll take a step back and do it again and go around, and then I'll take a step back until I get to about the free throw line, and then I'll start using both hands, and I'll go all the way around until I get to the three point where I'll eventually have to jump and use my hand, um, and I'll shoot around 500 to 1,000 depending on uh, if my twin girls are crying or not at home. When the season gets underway, the routines of playing, practicing and travelling mean there is much less opportunity for that kind of dedicated individual practice. But Toulson still finds time whenever he can to continue sharpening his shot. If I have enough time before practice, I'll do kind of the same routine, uh, but I'm not able to shoot nearly as much as 500 to 1,000 like I came in the summertime. But uh, also sometimes we have a great assistant coach, Antonio, who uh, he likes to put us through a few drills before we practice or even after we practice to kind of get into a good rhythm for specific games. Watching and learning from other players also provides an opportunity for even experienced professionals to make further improvements to their game. And Toulson has taken inspiration from one player in particular, Barcelona's Juan Carlos Navarro. My first year here in Spain, I was able to play against him not only in the regular season, but in the playoffs. We played three times. And it was a lot of fun watching him play. It wasn't fun because he killed us, but he's a, he's a great player, and uh, I've been working on the little bomba that he does ever since. Despite the many hours of practice, however, Toulson admits the ability to instinctively improvise is also very important for a shooter, something that becomes even more significant the higher level you play. In high school and in college, I had a specific move that I was always able to go to, but uh, I think as I came into the professional leagues, people started noticing those moves a lot quicker and uh, it made it almost impossible to get them off and so I kind of had to start using more of my instinct than those specific moves, especially because I'm not as tall or as fast as a lot of the players, uh, especially in EuroLeague. One major obstacle to shooters is the defensive efforts of opponents and Toulson identified two EuroLeague players who make it particularly difficult to get clean shots away. The two best defensive players that are just on the top of my head are Brad Olison, who plays for Barcelona, and uh, Terrence Kinsey, because they're both extremely athletic, and on top of that, they have a really long wingspan that can just reach almost any shot that you try to get off, and they're great defensive players. But basketball is, of course, a team sport, and Toulson believes shooters should also rely upon the strengths of their teammates to negate the efforts of defenders. If you have a really good team around you that can also take the pressure away from you, it'll help you get your shot off. For example, we have Jason Granger, who's a great uh, scorer, so a lot of people are focused on him when he's penetrating at the basket. So when he passes it out to me, I'll be able to have enough time to get off a good shot. As one of the biggest trophy collectors in basketball history, FC Barcelona legend Juan Carlos Navarro needs no introduction. He is not only the top scorer in EuroLeague history and the runaway leader in three-point shots made, but also ranks among the best ten players all-time in assists and steals. If there is a high point in Navarro's EuroLeague career, however, it had to be in the spring of 2010 in Paris, where he led Barcelona to its second continental title as the MVP of the Final Four. It was a moment that Navarro and his team came ready for. We were confident, we knew it was our opportunity to win a new league outside of home. We had one in 2003. Al final hicimos una gran final, sobre todo una segunda parte. Y bueno, imagínate para lo que significa para el club y, y para, para mí también especialmente, que ya gané una, pero sin tanto protagonismo como, como fue la de París. 
A defining moment in that 2010 title game against Olympiakos Pireus came late in the third quarter, when Navarro offered up a new variation of his trademark running one-hander La Bomba to beat the shot clock and give Barcelona a 14-point lead. Muy contento por, por hacer una bomba que es un, mi tiro característico. Eh, recuerdo que sobre todo en la segunda parte me defendían bastante agresivo porque había metido bastantes puntos, bastantes triples. Y sí que recuerdo pues, esa jugada que me voy hacia adentro y, y fue me, una bomba medio, medio gancho que, que fue también un poquito de suerte. Circumstances force Navarro to improvise on his way to the basket. Esta vez no tenía como digamos el pasillo central o estaba libre para hacer la bomba y como me estaban defendiendo en este lado pues tuve que sacar la bomba pero un poquito más alejado para que no me hicieran el tapón y, y al final salió bien. That single basket epitomized the feeling that Navarro and his teammates had all night that nothing could stop them on their way to the title. En la segunda parte ya, ya me di cuenta que el equipo iba muy bien, que yo me, me había encontrado muy cómodo desde, desde el principio. Y se escuchaba al público que decía MVP, MVP. Y, y sí que pensaba que, 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 que podía ser mi noche y, y una noche muy importante para, para toda mi carrera. En París, Barcelona became the first Euroleague champion this century to win both final four games by double digits, a feat that did not surprise Navarro. La verdad es que hicimos un año muy, muy completo, hicimos un buen juego, eh, había mucho feeling, mucha química en, en el equipo. En la final nos costó un poquito entrar en partido, que fue un poco más igualado, pero después en la segunda pues todo el mundo estuvo como un rodillo y al final nos fuimos de, de mucho. Five years later, Navarro looks back on the 2010 victory in Paris as having consolidated his yearly career. Primero fue un sueño ganar la primera Euroliga para este club, para Barcelona, con, sobre todo aquí en casa, con todo nuestro público, un Palau San Jordi lleno. Fue una cosa soñada, pero personalmente no, no era un jugador tan importante como en 2010. Yo creo que en 2010 fue como mi confirmación de, de, de jugador pues, importante en el equipo, con mucha más confianza, con mucho más peso. Y, y sí que la verdad es que a partir de ahí pues, la gente me me respeta mucho más. Alessandro Gentile of EA7 Emporio Armani Milan continued his great run of form to earn the B-Win MVP honor for Top 16 Round 12. Gentile led his team to a 99-85 victory over Laboral Cucha Vittoria on Thursday with a career-high 29 points. He also established a career-best with a performance index rating of 30, which was the highest of any player on a winning team. Gentile, who has averaged 23.8 points over his past four games, made four of five threes against Laboral, grabbed seven rebounds and dished four assists. Now let's check out the top five plays of the week. Number five, Istanbul, Turkey, the dynamic AJ Slaughter. Not an easy man to stop, but Justin Carter shows great hustle to do exactly that super block. Number four, Madrid, Spain, final seconds of the first quarter. Maccabi can't score. Marcus Slaughter with a good save. Rudy Fernandez takes it on himself, beats that buzzer. Off balance strike from way downtown, Rudy Fernandez. Number three, Istanbul, Turkey. Vladimir Jankovic makes a steal for Panathinaikos. He's not finished yet. Lovely pass. And Gani Lawal explodes at the rim. Started off by Vladimir Jankovic. Finished by Lawal. Number two, Istanbul, Turkey. Electrifying offense from Galatasaray. Comes to Justin Carter, who explodes over Esteban Batista for a sensational one-handed slam. 
Number one, Istanbul, Turkey. Another big win for Fenerbahce. Spectacular moment. Bogdan Bogdanovic somehow sinks it on half time. A three quarter court shot to beat the buzzer from Bogdan Bogdanovic. A crucial Clásico takes centre stage for the game of the week, while a pair of continental powerhouses prepare for battle in the quest to secure home court advantage in the playoffs. First place in Group E will be up for grabs in an eagerly awaited game of the week as Real Madrid travels to FC Barcelona for a heavyweight showdown that will see Euroleague's all-time leading scorer Juan Carlos Navarro going head-to-head -head with the competition's all-time leading rebounder Felipe Reyes. In Greece, Panathinaikos Athens and evergreen team leader Dimitris Diamantidis will look to tie up a playoff place in a crunch clash against the team which is gunning to take their place, Alba Berlin and never say die Jamel McLean. Maccabi Electra Tel Aviv and All Action Devin Smith will be aiming to establish their return to the playoffs in a home clash with Galatasaray Live Hospital Istanbul and ever dependable veteran Sinan Guler. Finally in Group E, Jalgiris Kaunas and Servena Zvezda Telecom Belgrade want to finish the top 16 with as many wins as possible to reward some of the most loyal and loud fans in the sport. At the top of Group F, the opportunity to take a big step towards home court advantage in the playoffs is the target for Seska Moscow and Olympiakos Piraeus in a mouth-watering meeting between two of the game's greatest playmakers, Milos Teodosic and Vasilis Panoulis. Two more teams with playoff aspirations go head-to-head -head in Spain as Laboral Kucha Vitoria and scoring threat Darius Adams attempt to put an end to Fenerbahce Ulker Istanbul and Nemanja Bielica's hugely impressive unbeaten run on the road, which stretches all the way back to October. And Group F's action is rounded off with a high-scoring Nizhny Novgorod welcoming Unica Hamalaga while Anadolu FS Istanbul will look to strengthen its playoff push at home to EA7 Emporio Armani Milan. We'll see you next week for more EuroLeague action.